Good morning, Nerejan. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Namaste. I didn't have my sound turned up. Namaste. Namaste. Uh, Richard has arrived. Good morning, sir. Namaste. Namaste. <laughs> Richard is there somewhere. <laughs> Yeah. Richard, Richard, yes, yes, Richard. Uh, Ravi has think... arrived. That's good. Namaste, everybody. Namaste, namaste. namaste, namaste. namaste. Winston's <laughs> arrived. Good morning, David. Good morning, team. Namaste. 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 Good morning, Chakwiri. Good morning, morning, Winston. Morning, David. <laughs> you don't need that jacket where you're sitting. <laughs> Unfortunately, the picture represents a memory, not the reality. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now we have Richard. Good morning, Richard. You were muted, Richard. You're not now. And good morning, Ali. Morning. So here we are, Thursday, 9th of April. So yesterday, uh, we talked about the fact that if you take those words that were in your original little statement underline the keywords and then for each keywords you identify well how will we measure those to know whether we're actually have got the knowledge or have got the skill or whatever else the other words were and I said that we'd come up with quite a long list and this is what came out when we did this with that aircraft company so we had that long list. And then if you remember yesterday, I said that uh, if you add them all together on all of your seven or eight drivers, there was one uh, organization, I didn't actually added them all up and it came to over 400. You can't measure over four, well you could, but uh, I don't think you'd be doing much else except measuring things. Uh, that some of those are far more important than others. Some of them are critically important and so if we've got say 20 or so against that particular driver, they're not all equally important. If you look at that list that you've created, some are going to be obviously not that important and you don't need to do any work on them to just push them into the background. Doesn't mean to say you never look at them, but right now they are not the ones that are going to have the most dramatic effect on our organization. And so I suggested that you made a shorter list. And the ones that I've marked up in red there are the ones that that particular group put on their shorter list. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, that they, they picked out the 10 that they thought were the most important. Then if you remember last night, I gave you the paired comparison tool. Uh, did, did, has anyone tried using it? Not yet, but I guess this weekend it will be one of the things to do. Yeah, okay. Um, I, you've got a picture of, of, a, of a filled in one, so I guess you could easily construct one of your own. And having that uh, on the right hand side of that, it got one, two, one, three, one, four, one, five, one, six, and then two, three, two, four, two, five, two, six, etc. down there. It's definitely a good idea to put that in and then use the ringing around the ones that you perceive to be the most important. If you try and do it without putting that nomenclature there, I guarantee you're getting a terrible mess with it. Quick one, David. You okay? Um, yeah, the qu a question I was going to ask is, you, you know, when it comes to the um, paired rankings, are, are you dealing with features that fall under one uh, for a particular driver? Yeah, these, these, these down here. This, oh, this, these are um, for the customer driver, isn't it? Yeah, this particular case it is, yes. Okay. But okay. you do it for all of them. Okay, okay. okay. Otherwise, you. you'll just end up with too many things to measure. Yeah, okay, okay, that's and, fine. And by putting them in order, I mean, in the, if you look at this one, as a consequence of this team having done the paired comparison, they came out with number of on-time deliveries as being the number one most important thing in the company. And, and there was a lot of discussion around this and they said that uh, the number one thing that will determine whether we win the next contract or not is our reputation for on-time deliveries. They were making aircraft undercarriages and wing structures and tailplanes and things like that. 
And uh, if you could imagine the manufacturer of the final aircraft, Boeing in this case, or Fokker in, in, in Holland, if you're late on a delivery, you just think of the costs associated with that. They can't carry on building the aircraft. And so that was their number one. And their number two, they thought was customer praise. I talked them through this thing about at one extreme, you get customer praise, to the other extreme, you get customer complaints. In between is indifference. They thought they were getting very little praise. Uh, they were getting quite a lot of uh, customer complaint at the other end. But for the indifference, they didn't know where they were. And so they were going to concentrate on measure, monitoring customer praise and obviously trying to improve on it. Third one, build to order time and delivery. Uh, that one comes up so many times on so many companies, especially people who are making big products like submarines and, and the like. Hey, and so on. Yep. Why are they yep. in that order on the list? What do you mean? Why in that four, four, five, three, six, two, ten, nine, one, eight, seven. Well, I, the, the list was didn't have numbers in it. That was just a list, and then I highlighted the ones that they thought were the ten, and then when they did the pair comparison, I just put that one came at one and that two. That's that's all it was, Steve. Um, you can. There's nothing magic about that. You can put it in any way round you want to do it. <laughs> as long as you get the as long as you get the numbers. So you can construct one of those, but as I also said last night, I would keep it to ten or fewer unless you're prepared to spend the whole of Easter doing the comparisons. The longer that list gets, the longer it takes to do it exponentially, because you're comparing so many more things with so many other things. Every time you add one on there, it's actually factorial whatever the number is. So it's seven plus six plus five plus four plus three plus two plus one. So you can actually see whether you've got it right. Now, again, another point that we brought, I like to, I'd like to emphasize because I, I think it's important. People all the time talk about key performance indicators. I never ever hear anyone say performance indicators, but that long list that I put on the previous slide are performance indicators. They're not key performance indicators. And you can't buy a book of key performance indicators because you didn't create them. You bought the list. So how can they be key? You know, it, it's, if you think about it, it's logic. So be careful to think, okay, someone's imposed it on you, but they are performance indicators. It's only you that decides whether they're key performance indicators or not. That's your choice. So even if they're imposed by the government or some regulatory body or something like that, you still create your own and then compare them with those and say, well, okay, maybe we've got no choice. We've got to hit this. Otherwise we won't get any more contracts with them. So then it does become a key performance indicator, but maybe some of your own are even more important than that. So this is your choice, not somebody else's. It's not imposed on you. It's your business, it's your organization, you own it, you're managing it, you're running it, you're inside it, and it's down to you whether it succeeds or fails, so therefore you've got to decide what the priorities are. And this is the point we're at right now. Are you okay with that? Now, as I've said down here on the bottom of this slide, I prefer I would prefer it if they were called critical success factors because I think it's more descriptive. You know, a performance indicator, that term for me, it doesn't do an awful lot, but critical success factors, they're critical to our success. If we don't get them, we're not going to be there. But, you know, the mass, the herd instinct prevails. I don't suppose I'm going to make people change what they do just because I, I've got a preference, but that's how it is. So then I, uh, we will look at uh, where do we go from here? Okay, I'm just going to give you an insight where we're heading next week. So this is a diagram you haven't seen yet, at least unless you've looked at one of my books. Um, this diagram I created a long time ago now, I actually originated that around about 1982. 
And I created it as a consequence of a visit I'd made to Komatsu. And I've been to Komatsu in Japan almost every single time I've been to Japan. And that's probably about 20 or 30 times. And Komatsu back then, it, I'd heard of Hoshin Canary, but I had no idea what it was. And we went, uh, it was while we were at the visit at uh, Komatsu and they talked about Hoshin Canary or uh, whatever's Hoshin Canary. And they explained it. And they had a diagram that wasn't exactly like that. I created that as a consequence of some uh, papers that, that Komatsu gave me. So that is actually based on, on Komatsu. And what we've been doing this week, if you look at this, I put, I put a blue box around it, so highlight it. We've only been working in here so far. And if you imagine that the work that you've done up until now, you happen to be the management team at the top of your organization or an organization, it's a fantasy one at the moment. But if you were the management team, what you've actually been doing today uh, or this uh, up until now uh, is um, what we might call policy development. All of this is policy mm -hmm. development. So we haven't actually done the vision for the top yet. I, I don't normally do that at this stage. What you have been doing is identifying the mission for each of the drivers. So we've kind of looks funny that we didn't start there, but it's actually easier to start here. And once we've done that and then identified the key performance indicators or, poly, uh, or success factors, that's pretty well where we are. We will need at some point to develop policies for the achievement of those. So if you were this management team in the real world and you've created all of that, then as a team, your next question is, well, fine, how are we going to put that into practice? And how much of it do we want to achieve this year? So we want to set up our annual goals. And you, you, can't, you can't go from having no Hoshin to having a totally organization-wide, fully operational Hoshin plan where the whole thing is buzzing and working. I would say in less than, if you've done it in three years, I think you've done very well. And if it takes five years, that was probably, I'd think, well, okay. If, to get all of it in place and everything done, it takes a long time. So this bit that you've just done here, okay, we've done it in a few one day meetings, but we're kind of rushing through it. If you were doing that for real in your own company, you. It's not that you spend more time in the room doing it, but you need time to think between each bit. And typically with that aircraft company, I had a three day meeting with the top team where we went through what you've been through so far, but we did that over three days. I then went back there a, a month later and in the month in between, they tidied all of that up. I don't know how much time they spent on it, but they tidied it up. I went back and I had another three days with them. And now we're coming along here. And then another three days, a month later, where they said, well, okay, how far do we want to have got by the end of this year, 12 months from now? So they set up then a goal for that year. And that was how much of the rest of the deployment of this. So this is deployment down here. Yeah. How much of that will we have in place at the end of the year? And it might be that in year one, we're just going to concentrate on taking it through to the heads of function. And so they would, they would have created all of this, share it with the heads of function, and then uh, enthuse the heads of function to do exactly the same as they've done. And to create a similar one of these for their own segments of the company. So that might be finance, operations, sales, uh, and, and, and uh, design and development and so on. So this would be whatever your operational functions are. And they would share it with their next level down. And they would then share it with that level down. And it might be 
depends on the size of the organization and whether it's multi-location or single location and uh, multinational and so forth. Uh, you would make in this decision up here, how much do we want to do for this year? And you might do an out, an out, uh, a, a, a sketch plan for how far do we want to take it down year by year and when do we want to get to the bottom? So if you like using, we haven't talked about PDCA yet, we will come to it, but I expect some of you are familiar with PDCA, Plan, Do, Check, Act. So this is the plan. This is the do, taking it down. Then, as we go down, we want feedback. If you go to a Japanese company that's, that's working along this, one thing that you'll find striking, because I've never seen it anywhere in the West, is the annual president's audit. And the president of the company, every year in top Japanese companies, actually does an audit of the company. I would challenge most of our presidents to even know what an audit was, apart from the financial one that the finance guys get them into every year. They wouldn't know. Some of them have never actually been in the factory, and I can say that for real. And But the president does an audit, and it's a detailed audit, and he will go right the way down to the line people. And that is pretty exceptional from a, from a Westerner's point of view. Now, from that audit, that will feed back into here. So we've got um, a feedback loop where we've got policy control, we've got the executive audit, we've got then uh, local departmental audits, our own heads of function will be auditing how well it's doing in here, right the way down to the small group activities at the bottom. That information all gets fed back up here and it goes into, you remember that uh, uh, radar chart that I put up? That will, uh, that will cause that radar chart to be changed, not wouldn't necessarily say on a daily basis, but it, it won't be just once a year. That will be a moving, a moving living part of, of our, it becomes really the war room, or if you like, the operation center for our company. This is how we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And so we've got the plan, we've got the do, which in the case of implementing it is the do. We've got the check, which is this sophisticated feedback, and then action, because they then take action on the differences between what were their goals and what is actually happening. Yeah? Is that okay? Stunned silence. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Right. Now, outside of that is the, what I call the powerhouse of total quality, and that is recognition and reward. If people are doing all of this, or there'll be some, there'll be some stars amongst them, and there'll be star groups, and there'll be sections that are doing something really good. And what we want to be able to do is to so it is a cross fertilization. So if one section or one department has found a really good way of doing something and it's transferable to other departments, then why not let them share what they've achieved with the other people? What better form of recognition is there for anyone than to say, hey, that was really good. Would you like to share that with the people? Because then that creates uh, tension in them in themselves but hey we got to do a presentation we obviously want to do that well and they're very proud of the fact that someone wants to listen to them and so in those companies they will have certainly an annual uh, quality day uh, in those top companies Honda actually have they shut the factory for two days every two years in Honda and I can't remember what they call it now I've forgotten the name but on those two days, they don't make cars in Japan, uh, but they have a workshop in the company that is not part of the normal manufacturing facility. It is available under supervision to anybody on the payroll who has got an idea that they might want to present during that two days. And they can go into the workshop and they can create things either as quality circles or as individuals 
It uh, fits in with the suggestion scheme as well as the quality circles. And during that two days, they have presentations in Honda of, of these ideas and there are awards. And Honda reckon that of that two days, there's usually every year, there's an innovative uh, improvement in Honda's design as a consequence of some ideas that have come out of, of these. If you go back far enough to people who can remember, can you remember distributors and um, uh, in a car, the, the little rotary distributor thing uh, in a car uh, that set off the spark plugs? You, you, in those days, you'd see a bonnet up by the side of the road because that mechanism had broken down and people were trying to fiddle ways of making it work to get a spark to be able to get home. Honda, if you lifted the bonnet of a Honda car, they didn't have one of those. And it came out of one of these uh, award things. They came up with this idea and you didn't see Honda cars broken down by the side of the road. You saw everybody else's, but not Honda's for that particular reason. So I call that the powerhouse of it. It's this recognition and reward and praise is probably worth more than anything else. And I have a, at a point that I always make if I'm helping anyone with this stuff, never pay anybody, this is debatable, you can talk about it amongst yourselves if you want to, never pay anybody one penny anything as a share in what any group in here has come up with directly. If we've done something like this, then continual improvement and business improvement is actually part of everybody's job because we're part of this unit. We're not just an extension of a desk. We're not just somebody who sits on a forklift truck. We're not the guy that sweeps the floor. We are an integral part of that model. And so you don't pay anybody else for so you don't pay managers for solving problems. It's an expectation that managers solve problems. And you say that's part of your job. Well, make it part of everybody's job solving problems so somebody comes up with something that saves a lot of money you don't share it directly with them but what you can do is to say well okay we'll make a proportion of that saving available to improve the work life of people and i've seen people put table tennis tables in the works canteen i've seen them agree and i mentioned this in an earlier one where the, agree, the team agreed to put some money in the hospital kidney machine fund. Their local hospital was collecting money for a kidney machine and they made a, made a payment to that and everybody in the company was more than happy with it. And so there are very um, innovative ways of dealing with that. Are you okay? Quick one, David. David, just a quick one. Um, what's your reason? I understand what you're saying. What's your reason for saying no one should be paid for it? Do you think directly, it, directly? Yes. Yeah. Um, because you... uh, there are there are several reasons. One, I actually think it's insulting. You're actually inferring that the person only works to just to get some money, when in actual fact it's part of their human life. You know, I'm proud of what I do for a job, and yes, I want to be paid, and I want to be paid reasonably well and I want to be comfortable we all do uh, that's a natural thing uh, but to actually be paid directly it's I, I don't believe in tipping by the way uh, because you're it's a kind of insult in Japan if you try and tip someone in Japan you look on their face you've insulted them people actually don't want to be tipped in Japan I think that isn't true necessarily for all taxi drivers, but there's even a lot of taxi drivers don't like it in Japan. And certainly uh, people who work in hotels that take your baggage up to your room, they will stand back in horror if you offer them some money. You know, they switch your TV on, they've shown you how the tap works in the bathroom, and you're thinking to yourself, oh, goodness me, how much does he want? He doesn't. He's doing it because it's pride in his job, and that's what he wants to do, and he wants you to be a happy customer in his hotel that's how he sees it and it's an insult to offer him money to do that but also uh, Winston this is a very important point the amount of money that goes through some departments is more than the total budget of some other departments 
And so if you've got some people in a department that are getting big paybacks, but people in other departments are doing projects that are just as valid, just as innovative, um, but the net savings could never be anything like these, that disparity will cause conflict internally. People will get jealous. But if everyone sees that we all benefit from it, the whole company benefits from it, you're actually creating cohesion in that society. You're making us feel we're all in this together. We're mutually dependent. I'm not going to hide my ideas from you and you go, because I know you're not going to steal them. We're all going to get recognition for it. So all of those negatives start to go out of it. This direct payment back to people is actually got a big cost associated with it, in my view. If I can build on what you said, David, um, yeah. Chuck Woody, my answer to you would be, think back to the exercise that we've just done in terms of identifying the critical success factors. And what you're rewarding has to support the behavior you're trying to create. And the danger is, if you just reward individuals for their performance, then the others who aren't performing to the same level then feel they're not being rewarded. And as a consequence, you create a great divide. Mm. So I come back to, it's about what you're trying to create. Because the danger is, um, you can actually reward the wrong behavior. So that's my only comment, Chuck Woody. Uh, if it makes a lot of sense because I just wanted to know your take on that because um, I read a book called Culture Code and you mentioned exactly what you're talking about. Someone in Google did something and, um, and people were asking him, you must be very proud. And he said um, he was just doing his job. So, yeah, what, you, what both of you said makes a lot of sense. Um, um, David, can, I, can I ask? So uh, I'm a little bit with Chick Woody in this point. So... Do you think that we do not uh, there is we do, do not need to reward individually at all? So directly did something, yes, directly, even saying this person well done, not oh. about money, but no anything, just no. 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 Money I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Reward in terms of hey, that was good. How about tell the rest of the payroll about that? Because for one thing. You're giving recognition to the individual because you wouldn't ask them to do that if you weren't impressed with it. And also you're sharing it with everyone so they all get the benefit from it. And so I'm very much in favor of people making presentations of what they've achieved. Mm -hmm. Actually, just I'll, I hadn't intended going here yet, but on that basis, supposing it is a small group within the company, and they don't have to, they can be a quality circle, but they can be any, any group of people. It could be just two people who confer together. And they come up with something, uh, typically in our society, because we just don't think these things through um, well enough. I mean, some people do, I'm, I'm not being generally critical, but people sometimes don't think and so let's suppose you have a group in a department, five people in the supervisor, and they work together and come up with something. And it could be one of the people in the group that makes the key remark that resolves whatever it is. And that gets known in the company that what's happened. And so the supervisor then gets the opportunity of presenting this on behalf of the team. How does the rest of the team feel about that? The, supervisors getting all of the accolades for this but it wasn't the supervisor's idea it might be partly and the supervisor might have been a good facilitator of it but it was the group that came up with it and i always if i'm actually in a company what i tell groups is that the group makes a presentation not any one individual the group make it and the, all of the group participate so let's suppose you've solved a problem in the department and it's taken maybe a few meetings to get there. And so bit by bit by bit, and you come up with a solution, you've tested the solution, it works. And now you need to present this to management. And you're saying, right, well, I want all of the team to participate in the presentation. In a lot of groups, you'll have some people who love presenting a probably 
belong to an amateur dramatic society and, and they have no problems whatsoever in standing up in front and they make a beautiful presentation. You'll have some other people in a group who are terrified, terrified. They won't sleep the night before. They almost have a heart attack at the thought of standing up and doing that. I'm obviously going to extremes. And between those extremes, there's the rest of us. And if, you have, if you're talking to the group about doing the presentation, as you get closer to it, you can easily, by body language, detect the ones that are happy about it. And you do a rehearsal, perhaps, and you can see somebody's going on a meltdown before you get to that. Okay, um, you don't have to present as such, but you can turn the flip chart sheets over or, or do something that you feel comfortable with in the group. Now, what I always find is that when they do that, and a presentation typically takes 15, 20 minutes, something like that, uh, afterwards, there's question and answer. What you find is that the person who was, did, would be, absolutely have a meltdown at doing the presentation actually doesn't mind answering questions. And they answer questions, and they generally want to make up for the fact they didn't speak, by, by trying to answer nearly every question. And so they come into it and they're really into it. And then the next time the same situation arises, you find they are actually quite happy to say a little bit. You give them, you know, something that's not too challenging and, and they do that and they're okay with that. I'm going to give you, a, there was a, 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 a clothing company up in the Northeast of England. Uh, they had high street tailors. They're not there anymore, but they, they got submerged into somebody else. But in that factory, there was a lady there who did precisely what I just said. She almost didn't want to come to the session in case someone asked her to do something. About six months later, I was asked by the Clothing and Footwear Institute if I could get a team from one of my companies to demonstrate how this worked. And I, because I'd only recently been working with this company, I asked them if they would be interested in sending a team down this was in London and they did and the, I was the t it was a whole day event they arrived around about 10 11 o'clock in the morning and the car park was just out of the window I saw the car park car a van arrive they come down from Hartlepool which is a long way down that same morning the back doors burst open and all these ladies that were in the team uh, with a coat hanger with the nice little suits that they'd made for themselves to do the presentation ran into the ladies loo and then a little while later they came out looking very very smart and came into the back of the room there were about 200 people in there and they were doing their presentation uh, first thing in the afternoon they, they ran up on the stage and who was the leader of the group and presented the group was this lady who wouldn't present before and i couldn't believe what i was looking at 200 people in there, cameras and all sorts. And afterwards, I said to her, Jenny, I, that was amazing. And she said, this has changed my life. <laughs> the fact that she had a, acquired the skill and the confidence of being able to stand up in front of people. Now, you're talking about recognition and reward she would say that that was recognition and reward for her. And so I tell you these little anecdotes to try and get you into the flavor of it. You know, the flavor of this sort of thing doesn't come out of textbooks, really. It doesn't jump off the pages generally. But if you can see a scenario in your own mind where it's actually happened, uh, then that's that. And you can imagine your organization that you've transformed from whatever it was like three weeks ago, using what we've now been through here, and there's more to do, more to come. You really have got the opportunity of creating a, a whole new world, and I'm not kidding, you really have. I'm actually trying to get uh, somebody from the company I've been working with uh, in a foreign country, I won't mention because they have sanctions against them, but I'm trying to get somebody from uh, the steel company I mentioned the other day to actually take you through what they've done as a consequence of all of this. And it, it's mind blowing. What I'm going to do is from here to then talk about the structure of the deployment process.
So I'm going to talk about the structure of, uh, of this coming down through the hierarchy. Now, Dinesh yesterday mentioned that the technique that we were using when we were going from the bad side to the good side and, and getting those things and then putting them together and, and, and having the label over the top, he uh, spotted the fact that this is actually using a, a concept known as affinity diagrams. You've been using affinity diagram as a tool to be able to identify these. And from, from that, you've started then to use the next tool, the tree diagram technique. Now, both of those are part of something which is called quality function deployment, QFD. If you go and look in a textbook on QFD, quality function deployment, you'll find that what I'm actually doing is talking you through QFD because QFD lends itself to Hoshin. It is a beautiful vehicle to achieve Hoshin. So we've used it at the front end, the affinity diagram, we've used the tree diagram and enables us to take it down. Just a point on Komatsu, when Komatsu do the, had got this right the way through the three levels, each year on their annual goals at each level, this is where we are, this is where we want to be at the end of the year. And they then split those goals into two types. One type is something which collectively everybody at that level can work together towards achieve just by improving their own way of working. They're not necessarily projects, as such, but we want to get from here to here over the year and we'll monitor as we go through the year how well we're doing. And each level is encouraged to do that. And then um, there are other things that could only be achieved, they know, could only be achieved by projects. You've actually got to have project teams and project groups to be able to do that. So separate them out like that. Now in Komatsu, they call this their flagship approach because you know the Japanese eat a lot of fish. And if you are anywhere near the harbor where the ships go out in the morning and come, the fishing boats go out in the morning, come back in the evening. So you watch the fishing boats come in and they have as many flags as they caught fish. And so you can see whether they had a good day or a bad day. So Komatsu call this their flagship approach after that. Once you are almost at the point of completing is everything in that green box on the left. And so we started off with, you've got eight of these or seven or eight uh, in the box there. You then broke it down into those keywords. You then got the measurables. You then decided on, uh, uh, pri on the priorities. Uh, or, so what the measures are, then the priorities. And this final column, I haven't talked you through yet, um, possibly might not even say more than I'm saying right now. Um, in that final column, there are some things that are down that list, which are nice to have, but you know from your experience in your particular field that they're actually not achievable, or you can't do better than you're doing right now, and we, we might not put them in the measures. But that is where we've reached pretty well and by the time we come back from Easter, I'm sure you will have completed that. Moving to the right, we now have the central matrix. So we've now got these measurables down here for our particular driver. If we then, on the matrix, along the top here, put the titles of all of the functions in the organization. So in this particular case, one function was engineering services, then sales, then planning and production, production, transportation, packaging, customer support, accounts, and so forth. We can put those along that part of the matrix. And then we come to the, take each one of these. Let's just stay with on-time delivery because that was the number one that came up. Uh, on time delivery. Then just taking that line, we could then say, right, for on time delivery, which functions are actually involved in that? 
Well, engineering services have some sort of influence on it or they're involved in some way. Uh, planning and production control, they're involved in some way. Production is involved, obviously. Transportation is involved. Packages is involved. So they're all involved, but I've marked that one in solid. And the reason I have is because we've agreed that these are the departments that are involved. Worry about the triangle in a minute. These are the ones that are involved. They're not directly uh, uh, affected by it. Uh, these are, but I'm going to make this one responsible as team leader. So I've now got for on time delivery, I've got a team made up of somebody from engineering services, somebody from planning, somebody from production, transportation and packaging. They're all involved, but I've made this person the team leader. This is the person that would call the meetings, get everyone together, get a meeting room and uh, agree that we're going to meet at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning or whenever it is. So and this one over here is a triangle because although they're not part of the team, they're not part of the problem, if you like, they do need to be kept informed on what's going on because they're on customer support. So they need to be able to tell the customer, you know, what's going on. So they're the ones that are involved. And that's what that would look like. For that particular one there, that was I just drew that line out. And then we do the same for all of the others. And you'll notice that some teams are bigger than others. And uh, the number of people who must be informed varies. It, it's not just necessarily one. There might be several because they need to know. So we've got that. And then what was the measure that we're, we're putting in here? An on-time delivery we've decided that the key measure for that was promises kept. Right, number of promises kept. How important is it compared with everything else on a scale of one to five? We think five, which is like very important. Level of customer expectation. Well, customers don't expect everything to be absolutely perfect. We live in the real world and these are arbitrary numbers I put in here, by the way. Let's say that they think that the customer would tolerate 85%, but they start to get upset. If, it, if it's lower than 85%, then uh, they'll get upset. Okay, what is our actual performance right now? 35%. Okay, so the ratio between these two is 0.41, which is altogether too big. So we put a ring around it. When we get to the point where we put a ring around something and some people use a traffic light system like red, yellow, and green. If the parameter looks okay, then it gets a green. If it looks like it's borderline-ish, then it'll get a, a, a yellow. And if it's like this one and this one here, flashing lights, someone's got to do something about that. That energizes that team to deal with it. And that energizes that team to deal with whatever that is and try and, and do something about it. So you can see how this is a living thing, what you've got now. And companies that are doing this will often have a room that they make available where they put these charts all around the walls. So that is, so that, that is the main part, what we've just looked at, of Hoshin. Taking it to the ultimate, it, this was from Panasonic Refrigerator Factory in Japan. And this is an LED that's over the production line and you'll find these in every department. This tells you, this 520, the number of, the number of refrigerators that is the target for that shift. The, 200, the top one of the 273s are the number of refrigerators that they should have made at this particular moment in the day if they're on track to meet that target in the evening. That is not linear. They've even worked out the biometrics that people work harder and faster and smarter at different times in the day and it's cyclical. And so they even take that into account. So this isn't a linear thing that you could calculate necessarily off the 520. 
The number below it, which just is coincidentally the same at this particular moment, are the number of products that they have actually gone past this sensor at that moment. That's the number that should have done and it just so happens they have. This is the cumulative minutes lost since the start of the shift. Now what happens, they use a concept in most of these companies called Jidoka and Jidoka is an idea where if someone has a problem on a production line, instead of them just fiddling around and getting a pile up behind that person, they actually stop, he kicks a button and the whole line stops. So everything stops from one end of the line to the other. And two or three, as soon as it does, a light goes on above wherever, whoever it was that pressed the button. And the members of his team off that diagram I just showed you will run over to him. He'll talk them through whatever the issue is. They'll resolve it get the thing going again, press the button, the line carries on, but that's recorded. And so from the start of the shift, they'd lost 13 minutes through these interruptions. Now, the cause of it then gets fed back. And at the end of the shift, that team will work on a project to try and make sure it never happens again. So during the shift, there'll be a number of problems and they get recorded, dealt with, and the next day when you come back in, the line will be just that much better and just that much less likely to get interruption than it did the day before. So it's a continuous improvement. And in Toyota, using this method, every year, something like 2,700,000 improvements of that sort, year on year on year in Toyota. And they're not all quality circle projects, they're suggestion scheme projects the management projects, all kinds of projects, 2,700,000, pretty well the same every year, something similar to that. And they produce a Pareto diagrams of, of the, um, you know, the, 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 the number of times a problem occurs and, and so forth. So I, I'm just going to quickly wrap up. Is everyone happy on where you uh, might now go with your group over the weekend, over the holiday, uh, back for Tuesday. Everyone happy with that? Yeah. Good, good. Okay. Stay safe, stay well, keep two meters apart and all the other things that we've been told all the time. Namaste. Pardon, <laughs> namaste. I look forward to seeing you all. So, Thank you. goodbye Bye. for now. Namaste, goodbye. Happy, happy Easter. Happy, oh, happy Easter, yeah. Happy Easter. Bye-bye. Yeah, happy Easter. Bye-bye.